Ah, parting off. Handed down from our forefathers, it is one of the most pleasurable processes to perform on the lathe. Yeah, right. Welcome back. Today I'm going to be making a new tool holder for my parting tool, but we'll talk more about that soon. That parting process you saw went well. There were no catastrophic events like the parting tool exploding into hundreds of pieces, and the end result, well, that looks pretty good as well. But that was not always the case when I was parting off in the lathe. I've had my fair share of loud bangs, broken blades, and scary moments. Well, that was until I watched this video by Quinn from the Blondie Hacks channel. And straight off the bat, if you are new to machining or turning on a lathe, or if you have always had issues with parting off on the lathe, then I would recommend you watch this video. Because this made parting off for me a lot less scary, and if I could say so, I guess enjoyable. Quinn covers a lot of important things in this video, like tool height, having a sharp tool, making sure the tool is square, and always using cutting fluid. And she talks quite a bit about rigidity as well. Locking down your compound slide, locking down the carriage, firming up the gibs on the cross slide, making sure your parting blade is secure in the tool holder and your tool post is locked down. All of these things add to rigidity which make the parting off process go a lot smoother with less chance of things flying apart on the lathe there. Why do I want to make a new parting tool holder? Well I did say less chance of things flying apart on the lathe. There's no guarantee that it won't happen. And if you have enough tool pressure that is built up to a point where it exceeds the tool strength, then the tool will indeed break and you'll have bits and pieces flying all over the place. This graphic is from Mark Presling, aka Prezo. Now he made a video about building a solid tool post that bolts to the rear of the lathe. And in that video he does explain a lot of benefits of having the rear tool post. Now that's not what I'm making in this video, but if you are interested, by all means, go and have a look at that because that could be a better option for some people. But Mark has allowed me to use this graphic to explain what happens when you have too much tool pressure and things go a bit nasty. In fact, Mark explains it extremely well in his video, so I'm just going to let him explain it here. Okay, so far so good. Now, let's consider what happens for a moment when we start to load up this conventional parting tool during a cut. Now, the force that's applied to the parting tool blade is basically downwards, and then the load is transmitted through the tool post, through the compound slide, to the cross slide. Now, this point here, this bullseye, is the fulcrum point. This is where everything is going to want to bend once the load goes on the parting tool. Now, of course, it's not just bending either. You've got clearance between the dovetail in the compound slide. You've got clearance at every interface between the tool post, the parting tool holder, and the blade itself. So all of those things add up to movement. But essentially what happens is it wants to pivot around this point. So let's have a look at what happens with that. I'm just going to zoom in a bit. So I'm going to take the whole assembly, tool post, compound slide, and blade, and we're going to apply that load around that fulcrum point. Now, straight away, you can see what's going to happen here. The blade is going to pitch forward. It's going to dig into the workpiece, and then you get this sort of a positive feedback loop happening. So the more the parting tool blade digs in, the more it wants to rotate around that fulcrum point, and the worse the situation becomes. Now, if you've got a light lathe and you've got some clearance between the compound slide and the cross slide, or you've got sort of worn dovetails and that sort of thing, then you're going to find that you get not only this situation, but you're also going to get a lot of chatter. So things are going to start to bend and release and bend and release and so on. But you're going to get a catastrophic failure when this situation becomes worse. So that's what happens when you've got a regular conventional parting tool at the front of the cross slide. Many thanks to Mark. That was a great explanation of how the setup can contribute to catastrophic failures. Now the question is, how is my tool holder going to be different to reduce these issues? 
And the answer is I'm going to build some flexibility into the tool holder. Now I know what you're thinking. John, you just told us everything had to be rigid. Well, yes, that's true. And all of the things I mentioned that were on Blondie Hack's video about rigidity are all true. But in regards to the parting tool holder, having some flexibility in there can drastically reduce the parting tool digging in and breaking. Now, this is not my idea, and it's certainly not a new idea. In fact, Armstrong were making flex parting tools for quite a while. And I came across a video by Mark from Winky's Workshop, and he made a little model and explains how it works. That's what I'm cutting off. When I go into the work, and this blade flexes, instead of digging into the work, it flex due to the pivot point here, the tool moves away from the work. So every time that tool grabs, it, it reduces, or it's self-limiting. It grabs and it gets out of the way. I'll put a link in the description because that's a really good video to watch to get a good understanding on how this works. Now Mark made a number of these flexi parting tools and he had a few sort of mixed results. So he had one tool that worked really good and he built another one pretty much identical and he said that it didn't work so well. But he came up with his own design in some of his later videos and it's that tool that I want to make for my lathe. Mark has kindly provided the plans free for download in the description of that video. So full credit for this build goes to Mark from Winky's Workshop. Anyway, I have done a lot of talking and I really need to get into some building. So let's get started. Okay, I think I've got myself organized here. This is the plan that Mark from Winky's Workshop had provided free on his website. And that's much appreciated, thank you. So, being in New Zealand, we're metric here. So I had to do some conversions to metric and kind of, I guess, round the numbers up and down to match the metric sizes of the stock we've got here. So for part A, I'm using a bit of this steel. This was a bit of scrap from somewhere. Part B, this part here, will be this 40 millimeter by 10 millimeter bar at the back. And part C, the little plate on the top, will be the 65 by 3 millimeter piece of steel there. Now I didn't use that piece of steel with the yellow tinge on it. I've had to use something different because I have a smaller tool holder than what Mark used. Anyway, those two bits of steel have been cut out and they go like that. And the tool blade will go in there. Now I need to drill four holes on the top here for these bolts. I need to find out the offset of these bolt holes. So I put the tool holder in the mill and I use the DRO to work out how far apart these bolt holes are using a firm fitting drill bit. Then I clean up the end of the stock. and I start drilling the four holes. I come back and drill out for six millimeter. You can see I've just removed the parallel so I can drill the last two millimeters there. This bolts together perfect. There's no problem at all. Instead of using that flat bar for part C, I had a different idea, and I'm going to use a bit of round stock for that. So this is cleaned up. And then I drill out and tap for M6. Ironically, this piece needs to be parted off, and the end of my paintbrush doesn't fit in the hole, so it falls down. Now I've set up in the mill and I'm taking off about two and a half millimeters here to make a flat. 
Then I set that up for the first part and I weld that piece on. And this is for the adjusting screw for the height. I had to grind a bit of an angle on here to match the angle of the tool post. Anyway, the adjusting screw will go in there. That will go down and clamp up. A locking nut will be put on here. So I've clamped the side part here on at 5 degrees. And that's so I can work out what height my tool is going to be. I've got a little pointy bit in the chuck. I square up the tool and then I can mark that off. I have part B marked out here, but I'm going to have to sort of deviate from the plans here. I don't think I'm going to be able to use these at all. As mentioned, Mark had a larger tool post and tool holders, and my one is a lot smaller, so the measurements here are too big for my one. However, it's going to be similar. We're still going to have a hole and a slit for the, you know, making this part spring up. At the bottom here, there's going to be another design as well because he has a T-blade. So he's cut two grooves in the part here for the T-blade to go in. But my blade is more of this shape. So it's kind of, I don't know if you can see that on the camera or not, but it's got a right angle at the top. There's a little tapered bit there and a little chamfered or tape a bit at the bottom and then we're on a slope down here so it's narrow at the bottom so when I cut out this slot here I can cut it flat I don't have to cut it like you know for a t-blade but then I'm gonna have to work out some other type of clamping because this side of my blade is, is tapered in so it's sort of in further at the bottom than it is at the top here so the slot's been marked out to match the height of my centre and that also gives me a little bit of adjustment up and down on the tool post as well because as the uh, blade comes out, because we're on a 5 degree angle here, the end of the blade here is going to be a lot higher than if it's um, choked up inside the tool holder. I'm going to first off square the sides off and the ends in the mill and then I'm going to cut the slot and after that we'll work on the hole here with the slit and then I'll work on a plan to clamp the blade inside the slot here. I start off with some basic machining on the sides and the ends to square them all up. Now I start milling out the slot for the blade and I'm start at the top there and work my way down. Once I get close to the size, I go very slowly here. I'm only doing probably one or two thou on each cut. And I keep testing the blade. And the third time the blade fits in there nicely. This is a 12 millimeter hole where this mechanism will spring. While I have it in the mill, I'm going to scribe the line where I need to cut the slot. Now I could go and cut this in the bandsaw and make a nice straight cut, but what's the fun in that? This cut came out nice and straight and a lot faster than the bandsaw. This hole is for the spring limiter. It's drilled out and we tap that for M5. And the limiter is screwed in, has a locking nut on it. This piece is going to be welded on the side here at 5 degrees. The blade fits in the slot nicely. And next I'll be working on the bracket that clamps down the blade. This is 5mm flat bar, and I've got it right on the edge of the jaws here. I have to take 1.5mm out, and part of it is close to the jaw, so it has to be above that. So it's not really holding in there by very much. I need to work out what angle this blade is, and it looks like it's about 3.1 degrees. So I set that part up again in the mill at 3.1 degrees. 
and again it's not been held in by very much here so I'm taking very light cuts these are two or three thou cuts the blade fits in there like that and the bracket goes there and there's a bit of a gap here where I can put a half a millimeter shim in there and that allows me to tighten the blade down more if I need to by using a thinner shim. I've clamped the two parts together without the blade and I'm just tacking it here so I can drill the bolt holes and keep all the alignment. Those bolt holes are drilled and tapped out to M6. I also countersink them because I'm using countersink bolts. That's the piece there and I don't know if you saw in the video but that weld came loose and I saw some movement there but I'm able to get this apart quite easily now. I'm marking out areas where I'm going to chamfer the metal so that I can put some good welds in there. I ground those chamfers off camera and I weld it all together in the vise. Everything is cleaned up and now I'm going to blue the three parts. So I start with the shim and the clamping plate and then I do the rest of it. Now I don't know if you can see this here but some of the steel is not actually turning blue. Here's a close up. I don't know what the steel is but it is not reacting with that solution at all. That black bit at the bottom is where it was welded and that blued with no issues. So I attempt to do some hot bluing here by heating the part up and quenching it in the oil. Assembly time and I bolt the tool onto the tool post holder. The blade goes in, the shim and the clamping plate. And those are all bolted down nice and tight. Right, let's test it out. This is 16mm round bar. First off I need to get that point of the tool on centre, so I do some adjustments. I also need to set the limiting gap, and I'm setting this at 10 thou. I don't know if that's too much or too little, but that's where we're going to start. The tool is moved to the right place, and then I lock down the carriage, as per normal parting off procedures. This has been sped up here. This tool cuts really good. There's no chatter at all. The only issue is the speed was probably a little bit slow once I got into the center. Now there's a little nub here, but I'll talk about that shortly. Well there it is, the tool is complete and I've just tested it on a few round stock items here and I've got to say man this works really well. Now you did hear a bit of squealing when I started on this larger stock, this is about 2 inches, 50 millimeters, but that went away as soon as I engaged the power feed for the cross slide and it went through the smaller stock just as good. Now I did talk about there's a little nub here and the reason for that is the shape of the tool and it's probably really hard to see here but I might put a graphic up or a picture but on the right hand side there it's got a little taper in there and of course as you're turning that little taper causes the nub to stay on this part of the work which is in the chuck. I don't know if that's the design of the tool, how it is supposed to be, or what the story is of that, but it is kind of unusual to have 
that little taper or chamfer on the top of the tool there. At the end of the day, you can always face off the stock that's still in the chuck and get it nice and flat again. And the other side that you actually part off won't have the little nub on it, which is probably what you want anyway. Now, I have never got a chip like this from parting. It's just peeled off and with the power feed and gauge, it just get coming off in one big stream. That might be also to do with the geometry at the top of the parting tool there. Anyway, I'm very pleased with the end product here and it seems to be working well. I will do more testing with it each time I need to part something off, but first impressions, it works really good. So I think the next step is to, oh, looks like someone's at the door. Whoa, now I'm excited. I've been waiting for this to arrive. This is a new toy. No, no, sorry, a new tool. So tell me, can you guess what it is?